Hey, in this interview, I get to sit down with badass photographer, Michelle Grenier. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. Today I'm sitting down with someone whose branding is amazing, but her photographer is her photography is even more amazing. Michelle Grenier uh, came uh, I came across her through the folks at Skyloom and then just quickly got lost in her work on her website. So we're going to talk about her work, how she positions her work. What is action photography? What is all the stuff that she's, she's sort of rebranding an entirely new genre of photography and doing some cool post-processing to boot. Michelle, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hi, Frederick. So nice to meet you. I'm very good. <laughs> it is nice to meet you as well. See, you know, you normally on these shows, I, I, I ask photographers, you know, how would you like me to introduce you? What is your title? What's the best way to introduce you? I had I didn't ask you what your title was because on your website it has <laughs> badass photographer. So you are, <laughs> and that that better be on your business cards. It better say badass photographer. Yeah, I gotta look at this. Yes. <laughs> yeah, if you have business cards, who uses business cards these days? Yeah. Here? Well, cool. Well, welcome to the show. It's good. To, it's good to have you on. Thank you so much. Yeah. So let, let's start. So I want to I want to first before we dive into the work and kind of the stuff that you do, I want to hear a little bit about your origin story and what, what you got, how what you got, got you started in photography and, you know, as, a, as either a hobby and then transitioning to a career or did you jump right in as a career? What, what's the origin story of Michelle? So my origin story, believe it or not, I've never touched a camera before I was 30 years old. So I used to work like any, anyone uh, to do jobs. And I was just changing. How do you, how's the expression in English? Like you split, change quarters for a dollar or how do you say this in English? Uh, you change quarters, make change. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a French thing. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and basically I was just doing a job that I didn't really enjoy. And I was doing that for like two years or so. And then I was changing job. And mm -hmm. I, at 30 years old, you know, maybe it happens every, like you, it happens at 20 years old and then 30 and then 40 and then 50. And you just take a time to think about your life and where is it going? And if you really enjoy what you're doing mm -hmm. and I turned 30 and I was like, okay, clearly my life is not where I hoped it was supposed to be at this point. And what, what do I do now? And I've just started helping uh, a friend. She's a professional photographer and she was doing uh, weddings and I was her helper. So I was kind of uh, working with her and giving her like bringing her stuff and things like that. And I got really interested in that. So I, I started by taking just uh, like beginner's class for photography. And I bought my first camera, like 400 bucks, an old Nikon D5000. Mm -hmm. um, I remember uh, that body. It's it, it was okay, but it was already I think eight years old when I bought it, and that that's all the money I had, and I needed like a manual manual um, setting mm -hmm. in my camera, yeah. so I got this one. And as I learned to do photography, I realized that I really really enjoyed it. So I've decided to go and uh, to go back to school full time. So I've been. I was working like I've been working 15 years of my life full time. And I was I decided to go back to school at 30 years old full time wow. to learn photography. Wow. OK. And uh, well, I've got my degree. And I mean, by the way, no client ever asked me to see my degree. <laughs> but I've got my photography degree. And that's that was uh, that's been the beginning of my photography story. You know, that's interesting because that's the first time I've heard someone, literally, I've, I've interviewed hundreds of photographers. That's the first time I've heard someone take that path where you are in one career and then you have that epiphany moment mm -hmm. and then you decide, you know what, I, I got to make a change. I don't like what I'm doing. I'm going to do something else. When when I've heard that story before, then people make that change and they jump into photography and then live happily ever after or whatever. But I've never heard someone as methodical as you and say, okay. I'm going to go get trained 
in this art form and then move on. Why didn't you just leap over the training and then, you know, sort of learn through YouTube and online resources and just trial and error? What made you go, you know, pull the trigger and go to school for it? I think I did both because uh, school had helped me for a lot of things and I've made great connections with uh, other people that became like partners and helped me grow my business uh, through the years. But I've learned a lot of things because I, even when I've started uh, photography school, I knew what I wanted to do was sports photography. That's mm -hmm. what th this was like the field I really um, like to do. So, you know, in school, you learn like uh, cooking, not food photography, and then you learn macro and then you learn like product photography and all th this kind of different stuff that I wasn't genuinely interested in but it still helped me in my uh in my like learning process process um so i've learned even though i was going to school i still um there's a lot of things that i learned by myself and uh, i think some of those things are are those is what I carry with me most of the time. I don't know if you mm -hmm. like understand what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Because it, it, it is, you, there's only a certain amount that you can learn in school, right? And yeah. it, you, you have to, it's kind of like, what was the analogy someone used? It's kind of like if you, uh, you want to learn karate, and you could read every book that was ever written on karate or watch every movie. But until you get into a fight, you're not going to understand what it all means. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Same I, with photography. Exactly. Until you get out there and shoot and figure out and make mistakes on your own. Yeah. It, it, it has to click in your head. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You have to be on the field. And for me, uh, I didn't so much enjoy to spend time in uh, the studio and we were spending like a lot of time on the studio at school and that's that's fine that's really perfect but for me when I like get to get my creative spirit alive is when I was in the gym so a lot of things I learned and I've tried and I failed was on the weekend and on the like every night when I went to the gym and just took photographies there. Wow, that is that is fantastic. What a great story because this is like that's inspirational for people that, you know, there's there's all different kinds of learners in the world. There's some people that, you know, could never go to school and and sit in a chair and listen to an instructor or even do it online. They'd rather just go buy a camera and go make a bunch of mistakes for a couple of years and then get good. I think that's a, that's a good way to do it sort of methodically to move into it. So Michelle, what, what, what moved you into the genre of action sports or sports photography versus portraiture? You know, you started in weddings assisting and then you ended up in sports. What describe that journey? Um, so I started as, um, an, uh, you say assistant in English, for my assistant, mm -hmm. assistant. Yeah. So I was, I've been an assistant, but for um, like maybe two summer, two summers, two summer seasons mm -hmm. with my friends. Um, but I've always been someone really like I wouldn't call myself an athlete, but I'm always someone that enjoyed doing sports. So either it was volleyball or bodybuilding or CrossFit or Olympic weightlifting or things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I've always been someone who did a lot of sports, so it was natural for me. And I've already got a big, um, um, network around this, this feature, like, yeah, around yeah. that was your, your, your comfort zone, your comfort zone or community. Right? Yeah, my community. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And at the time, my husband was the co-owner of a CrossFit gym. So I was. Uh, during the day because it was full time during the day I was at school and then at night I after the school was over I was going to the gym like it was the name of the gym was uh, CrossFit Levy in French mm -hmm. yeah so I was going there, there to train myself to train and also to see my husband because he was always working there so if I wanted to see him I had to get to the, to the gym nice. yeah. so basically, two, two birds with one stone right yes <laughs> So I was spending all my time either at school or in the gym. 
And um, I always brought my camera with me and my friends were working out. So once my workout was done, I was just picking my camera and trying to the stuff I learned at school. So oh, I will try like to work with my uh, the shutter speed or my aperture or my, you know, depth mm-hmm. of field and things like that. Yeah. So it, it was really natural for me because I was always in this environment. What would you say is the, mo- the most challenging thing in photography for you so far? You know, has it, has it been, you know, understanding the, the, the physics of it, of f-stop shutter speeds ISO? Is it dealing with clients or dealing with the, the subjects? Is it, or lighting? What's, what's been the hardest thing for you to sort of internalize, you think? This is a good question. I think the first thing that comes to my mind is to deal with how to work your way in a crowded gym without being noticed and with, and also while being able to get the shots you want without interfering with what everybody else is doing. Because I couldn't just tap on the, head, on the shoulder of someone and say, oh, excuse me, could you stop doing your burpees and move aside because I want to get like this guy in the back of the gym. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of making myself forgotten and also like being able to move around what are the secrets to doing that? Because it seems like in a gym or when people are, are pro- you know, probably the most vulnerable, you know, for the most part during their day, they probably don't feel like they look their best in the gym. And then, well, some of us, right? <laughs> and then, but then you go in there with a camera and you're, you know, especially these days where any picture could be all over the world in a matter of seconds, right? So how, how do you overcome that that fear or the resistance of of the camera inside a gym environment first of all okay i've got a couple ideas a couple answers to that first if you're not getting noticed people are not going to know they're being taken in photograph yeah so i think that's tip number one just get yourself really small and walk around and they won't even see you and usually when they're working out pretty hard they, they're really in their zone, so they, they're not looking at you, obviously. They don't pay yeah. attention to everything that's going around. Second thing is I've got plenty of really bad shots. I've got more bad shots than I get good ones. And the second tip I would say is just I don't show all of them. I just show the good ones. Yeah. So people, when they look at my picture, or I hope when people know that I'm going to be at a certain event they think oh i'm i'm really happy we're gonna have great shots because they know that i i only show the like the cream of the crop yeah yeah and it's I, like an iceberg right it's like yeah, the, oh, iceberg, yeah. the iceberg you only see the little top at the at the very tip top but below it it's giant right and the the a giant amount of you know not failures but let's call them experimental shots <laughs> below the water line <laughs> and then the yeah. ones that you show are above the water line yeah i've got like a, a 10 to 20 percent keepers and that's even though i've got like i I think for me, the best gear I could possibly get. And I've got a lot of experience because it's not um, staged. So it's impossible to have a 100% keeper in what I believe what I'm doing because it's so um, spontaneous that you, I can anticipate that I I think this guy is going to do like this move or is going to, I don't know, do something. And then this is not happening. So the yeah. shots I took are obviously not good. But is that is that the spontaneity or the, the sort of randomness of, of shooting like that? Is that part of what draws you into it versus doing more staged and, and commercial type photos? It's almost like street photography, photojournalism type portraiture in an enclosed environment. Yes, uh, that, that's a good, uh, <laughs> yeah, a good way to say things. Um, yeah. I think sport two reasons first it it's a lot with my personality because i like i'm more of an intro on the introvert side Mm -hmm. so to me to being forgotten is like perfect to me i i don't have to interact with anyone i don't have to tell anyone what they what they should do like stand like this look like this work like this and also because it's kind of a treasure hunt yeah. Like you have to anticipate and to know, obviously know the sport you're shooting. 
And with that, it's, it's, I'm thinking, a lot of people think I do like baseball or soccer or football or hockey because I'm from Canada, uh, which is not the case. I do uh, sports-related photography. And um, I don't even know why I'm saying this. I wanted to say something and I lost my idea. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm curious, just sort of uh, like when you're in that environment, you know, moving around, the challenges. Yeah, you talked a little bit about like becoming invisible in the environment yeah. so that you can you can get the shot but you're not invisible and you're you know a, a woman in the gym taking pictures of males and females does that does does that impact like I, I could see this you know huge buff bodybuilder and a, and a pretty woman with a camera comes up and he sees you shooting them does that affect the shot at all does that give you more of an opportunity to get the photo or less of an opportunity to get the photo? This is a good question. I think it would depend on the, the athlete, but usually let's say I go to a powerlifting or a strongman or a CrossFit, CrossFit competition. And usually they, they know beforehand that I'm going to be there. Mm -hmm. I think it gives me more opportunity because, uh, I think, I hope uh, some of them know me. So, they're looking for getting nice shots and okay. they, they're, they're familiar with the work and you're like you said at the beginning they're part of your community anyway right yeah i i think so most of them mm -hmm. so i think they're only they just want to see themselves perform at their best so i think they're giving like this ex little extra push to really get this spirit in uh, an image yeah. No, oh, I love that. I love that. So you, they're like, okay, I have to, I'm being photographed now. Let me put on my best and let me flex a little harder, you know, <laughs> <laughs> live out the light. This is my good side. Let me go. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try a new PR like, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to do this uh, snatch, but I'm going to try to, to put like 10 pounds more because if I get it, oh my God, I'm going to get like this really crazy picture. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, that's cool. That is really cool. What a great genre. This is, I've never, I've, you know, the first person I've spoken to that, that shoots like that and that is fantastic and the shots obviously show it as well let's let's talk about gear a little bit so yep. you're in that environment you're indoors for the most part probably lots of natural light in there yep. for the most part maybe not in some areas what what camera system do you shoot with what lenses uh, that that work to let you do the things that you do so i've started like at the beginning of my uh, story i i started with a noble nikon d5000 yep and then I've upgraded, my first upgrade's been to being from crop sensor to full frame, obviously, because it would, it helped me with my higher ISO, because as you say, um, I'm a lot of times in the gym, sometimes mm -hmm. I'm doing events like outdoor events, but I would say like 80% of the time I, I'm indoors. Yeah. And I really need to be able to crank up my ISO, ISO because I need to be at least at one 500th of a, of a second to freeze the motion right exactly uh so to step up my game with the full frame helped me and then about a year ago a little like in march 2019 i switched from dslr to uh mirrorless yeah and uh it's been a great it's big it's been a big uh investment uh, and it's also been the the greatest investment I did in my sports photography. And why 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 has it been the greatest investment? Because uh, you know, I've, yeah. obviously, we know what mirrorless is, but yeah. in 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 the context of sports photography, what would have been the benefit? So with the body I chose, I've got this amazing uh, autofocus. Like it it recognizes the face, it recognizes the eyes. Uh, I can just press a button and basically tell my camera, look, I want you, I want you to follow like this, this athlete and I'm click, I'm pressing a button. And I, as, as long as I don't release it, it's going to follow the athlete wherever he or she goes in the gym. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's yeah. amazing. So it's been a big, uh, the autofocus has been a big game changer for me. Also, um, the ISO quality or the ISO capability, uh, abilities capabilities mm -hmm. yeah both yeah oh, okay <laughs> uh are are even better than my dslr full frame so 
So yeah. I can go, like, I could go, I guess, to 100,000, which I never do. But if I go up to, like, uh, what do I do? Like 12,000 or 12, yeah, 12,500, 12, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, there's, like, no noise at all. Yeah. And even if there was noise in there, the software these days, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, can can mitigate that, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, it, it's almost magical. It's scary that what these what what can be done at these high ISOs versus what just ten years ago was impossible or science fiction. Yeah, oh, it, yeah. it's crazy. What what brand are you shooting? Is it Sony? Are you still with Nikon? Did you switch over? I switched uh, from Nikon to Sony last. Okay, I made so. the the big leap, and uh, I use uh, the um, largest apertures I can use usually. So this is one of the reasons I'm only shooting with prime lenses, mm. which is, uh, I think, maybe a bit different from other sports photographers, which usually usually use like a 24 to 70, yep. f2.8, f and then 70 to 200, f2.8. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, I felt like it was more beneficial, and I really liked the, the look of the 1.8, of what an f1.8 could give me. Uh, so I've got like a 55, I've got the 135, which, which is my all time favorite lens. The 135? Yeah, yeah. I love, I love this lens. Um, I've got a wide angle, but I, I don't enjoy as like as much my wide, my wide angle as my 55 or my telephoto lens. What would you, what would you say is your, your most used lens? If you were to go in software and sort by lenses, which, which lens would have the most photos taken with it? Uh, I, good question. I work always with two cameras at the same time. Mm -hmm. I, I have a hold fast, um, a moneymaker, um, strap or hotness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I've always got my 55 and my 135. This, this is like my basic setup in the gym and if the gym is really small or, or I'm really like, I don't have much room to, to play, then I will switch my 135 for my, uh, what is it? The 28, 28. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Oh, interesting. That is really cool. That is your, you're right. That is unique. Most the sports photographers, but again, you know, a lot of sports photographers are, are out and about, and they need that zoom range you know, in order to not be running back and forth all over the place. Yeah. But if, but if you're in a fixed environment where you know where everything is and you don't necessarily need the zoom, yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting though. You know, some depending on when you grow up, it, you, the stigma around zoom lenses used to be that they're just not as sharp as as prime lenses. But now that's not necessarily the case. You know, the the optics have come so far that it's yeah, it's more of a choice now, right? So. And a lot of the photographers I speak to, particularly the portrait boudoir or, you know, though that that genre of photographer usually stick with one lens. It's interesting. That's why I was asking. You know, I was curious if you do the same. They usually stick with one lens. And if you sort their their library, it'll either be a 50 or an 85 yeah. or a full frame. And that's it. You know, that's yeah. all they shoot with. And then they concentrate on everything else and not worry about the, the focal length at all. So yeah, yeah that, is, that is really cool. Okay, so now that, let's move it along. So we started with the origin story. Yeah. We moved on to, you know, how you're able to blend in and get the shot in the gym. And and then we talked about the, how you're getting the shot, the, the camera and the lens. Once you're done, you have the shoot, you got everything on a, on a memory card, you're back at the computer, what happens then? What, what's the what's the next step in the process? Next step, usually when I come back from uh, a sports event, I come back with anything between two thousand and maybe four thousand images for a day. Wow! So I quickly learned that using any kind of regular imp software to import my images was like painfully long. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I did my research when I started and I found out that, a um, photo journalist use, uh, used photo mechanics. Mm -hmm. So this is my importing, um, software. I hear that over and over again. People love photo mechanics yeah. and, 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 uh, just, uh, sorry to interrupt you, a slight segue. 
we're going to be talking to them for the show, hopefully in the next, you know, down the road. So, you know, photo mechanic is, is, uh, is kind of a staple for a lot of photographers, at least on the importing side. Yeah. So really interesting. Okay. So now everything is ingested. You've yep. got that, those memory, that memory card or those 4,000 images, you've brought them in through photo mechanic. How is that? Are you rating as they come in and sort of say, yeah, I like this one, this one, this one, this one, or are you just using photo mechanic to ingest everything and bring it into the computer? I also sort my images there. Well, it's not really a sorting. It's just like, I like it or not. So it's, mm -hmm. I, it's just a, a binary choice, right? Uh, good or bad? Yeah. Good or yeah. bad. Mm -hmm. And then I do, a, if I, it's a day when I've got like 4,000 images, I will run through the whole, uh, li not library, but folder uh, first time. And then I will just look at the ones I liked and go through a second time. Because sometimes there are like two really similar pictures. And I, I mean, I don't need to deliver or to give like images that are really look alike. Sure. Yeah. So I will go through and then I will, I might uh, get rid of a couple more images. And uh, once this is done, I open the Photoshop camera raw uh, software mm -hmm. and I do my basic editing and things like that. And then where the magic happens is I create uh, a look for this specific day on Luminar, and mm -hmm. then I run the batch processing through my, I don't know, maybe 500 images that are, are going to be delivered that day. Oh, wow. Okay, so you're, okay, so you ingest with, with Photo Mechanic, you bring everything in. So where, how does... How does uh, Camera Raw fit in there? So there's Photo Mechanic, then yeah. Camera Raw, and then Luminar. So you do basic adjustments within within Camera Raw, yeah. and then you apply that special that special you know okay. badass look yeah. in <laughs> in in Luminar. And it just you know just just for a little bit of color on Luminar, it's use. It's looking at each one of those images individually and applying effects to them. Can you describe that just a little bit? Because I know that that's sort of unique versus other apps where you say, yeah, I want I want this much saturation, this much clarity and bring the exposure down a stop. Boom. And then you apply that. And it's going to apply that to those 4000 images the exact same way. Yeah. Luminar doesn't do that. Right. So it looks yeah. at each indi Im Im image individually. Can you explain that a little bit? It's uh, well, I'm not a technician, but I could say like on my side what what it does to my to my images, which is really cool, and I could have never hoped to do something like that before that. Uh, it's with the it's like Luminar has an AI technology, so it's almost more intelligent than I am. <laughs> so if on my basic look, like I create one look for this day, so let's say I pick any of the 500 images I'm going to deliver to my client. I pick one image, I open it in Luminar, and then I say, okay, what look do I want uh, to apply that day? So I want to apply, you know, uh, structure and AI enhance, and then I want to add a vignette and things like that. And then they have this AI portrait tool, which basically, if I want to smooth the skin or remove blemishes or enhance the eyes, I include this in my look. Mm -hmm. And then once I'm going to run the batch processing, it's going to look through every single image. If there's a face in the image, it, it's going to recognize it. If it's a male or a female, where the face is, and it's going to smooth the skin differently for each and every, every single image, which is That's crazy. Yeah. It's that is, that is just crazy. Yeah. See that that's, that's part of that magic stuff you know like we talked about the noise reduction in the low the low iso yeah. you know and then this is the other part of that magic equation oh yeah yeah are you are you creating like for a particular shoot do you create individual looks for that shoot or do you have a library of looks that you choose from and you're like okay look number or whatever for this particular shoot and and then let it go i like to you know what's really cool also is that when you save a look if you're not stuck with the look, you can always go back and tweak it and then mm -hmm. save it as another version of that look. Uh, so I have multiple looks 
And for example, if there's a gym, I'm going back uh, a few times in through the year. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a look for that gym because the light usually, you know, the uh, the windows are at the same place on the gym and things like yeah, that. Yeah, right. So the light is the same. So usually the look looks nice to for every photo shoot I'm going to do in this specific gym. Um, so I have those looks. And usually I editing is a part that I really do enjoy. So usually I always go back and tweak a little bit. Mm -hmm. Just to make sure, like the 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 look is really on point and fits the the um, the mood for that specific day. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I would expect that. So you would, you know, go through that entire process. But now, at the end of that, you you're close to being done. But you know, as as a quality control measure, absolutely, you're going to go back in and touch and look at everything and make sure it meets your standards, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that is fantastic. Okay, then the then the last part is you've gone through those four thousand. You've whittled them down. You've done the processing on them. They all you have a group of photos. Let's say you know I don't know what would the number be from a four thousand image shoot with, that you'd end up with. Do you think maybe like five hundred something like okay. that? Okay, so you have five hundred images that that you're you're done with. And you're ready to deliver. How do you deliver those images? How, how, and how does the client get them or and or see them? Uh, there's usually I have two different, uh, way to s sell the pictures or sell my services, either the, the gym or the organization of the event, uh, pays me for the day. So I just deliver them the images. It's really easy. Like, uh, I do that to like with transfer and I do a zip folder and I, oh, okay. okay. This. So really not, a, not in the cloud, not online. They physically get the, the, the zipped images. Yeah, on this version of a uh, 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 contract, mm -hmm, this is an mm -hmm. option. And the other one is uh, I sell the images directly to the athletes. So in this case, I will upload them on Pixie Set. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know uh, Absolutely. The, the website. Uh, yeah, I'm a fan. Yeah. So I just create uh, an album from for this day, and I upload all the images if they are like – for example, if it's a powerlifting event, I will separate um, uh, the album, like uh, the, the squat and then deadlift and then bench. Mm -hmm. So they can go to each folder folder and easily find themselves. And I op upload them in the, um, um, like the time it's been, uh, how do you say this? The time it's been taken, like. Oh, oh, in in uh, chronological yeah. order. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's important because I sometimes I see photographers uploading um albums and I'm like everything's all over the place, you know? There's no logical like how can someone try to find themselves if it, mm -hmm. it's like all mixed up. So chrono chronological order is a good tip. <laughs> that is great. That is great. Yeah, Pixie Set is great. I, I'm a, I'm a fan of that that service. Um, but there are lots of great services like that. There's Pixie Set. Obviously, there's Smug Mug. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and on and on. Depending on, they're, they're kind of like um, it's almost like cameras and, or or computer operating systems. You have to pick the one that fits you and yeah. your your business because there's no one 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 to one service to suit everyone. Yeah. So. No, that is fantastic. Congratulations. As long as you have the process down, you are laser focused, uh, transitioning from that old career to this new career <laughs> and creating great work and you're respected in looks like both communities now, photography and sports, <laughs> right? So I that's, hope that's so, yeah. That is great. You're that is great. So what's next? What's next for Michelle? What's the what's the next thing, uh, the next rung on your ladder? Uh, but this is a good question because we we're kind of in a time of uncertain uncertainties, mm -hmm. and yeah. in, in Canada, like in Quebec City, my big uh, season is summer, and like we are in the beginning of what should be my big season. Mm -hmm. So this year is going to be different than any other year. Um, so I don't know, photo shoot wise, what it's going to look like on the next few months. But uh, I've been writing articles with, for the Photo Focus website, mm -hmm. um, which I re it's a part of uh, photography that I really enjoy, like uh, edu the educational part. And uh, I've, so it's allowed me to write a little more, 
to take time to write more articles, to create like uh, I've participated uh, to different webinars. I have did videos um, and tutorials. So the online education part, which I was already doing a little bit before like all this crazy time happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been doing it a little more now and I really do enjoy it. I really yeah. like it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 I think it's obviously a, a, a suboptimal situation that the, the entire planet is in. But I think the, the other side of that is it's forcing a lot of people to embrace the virtual side of things, yeah. which, which was always there to begin with, but it just, we never had to rely on it. So now businesses, you know, either whether it's work from home or, Service businesses like yours are are learning and embracing new ways to reach out to customers and generate revenue, which is good because when we come out of this, now you'll have strength in that area as well as what you had before, right? So you'll come out stronger. I think it's I think it's good. It's- yeah, and I'm learning like to do podcasts, and it's my first podcast. This is your first podcast? Yeah, so I've never done any podcasts before. Oh, great. Yeah. All right. Well, good. Well, so forever I will have been your first podcast. Good. <laughs> good. Well, welcome. You're doing, you, you've you done and you are doing great. So if uh, if people want to connect with you and, and, you know, either hire you for work or bring you on their podcast or webinar <laughs> or otherwise, what's a good place for them to, uh, to connect with you at? Uh, I think the easiest place would be on my website. So it's uh, Michel Grenier photo.com so for english speaking people would be like michelle grenier photo.com got it thank you (laughs) (laughs) and just just for the audience just just to be clear we had like a five minute conversation before we started (laughs) recording on how to pronounce your name and i still had to default to the (laughs) english pronunciation (laughs) Or the non-French accent pronunciation, right? So, so, well, good. Well, congratulations again on everything, Michelle. I, I appreciate you coming on, and uh, best of luck with everything in the future. Oh, thank you so much, Frederick. You've been a wonderful host, and good luck for to all your upcoming podcasts, and thank you so much for having me. This episode was made possible by our friends at Fujifilm. Make images, share stories, and experience moments at the speed of life with Fujifilm. Thank you for staying home with us.